Ch check out the Google AI music creator. It's freaking amazing. Um, you can even kind of like make fake words. So like you can actually get vocal tracks, which was the hardest thing to do. Like if you put a, a drum machine together, it's very easy to get like different drum rhythms. And even melodies like are starting to be able to, you know, you can program melodies. And of course, you're, like you're saying, they're subjective. Um, and you can read about like what Paul, how Paul McCartney described melody and stuff like that. Like, you know, you stay within a key, but you have to know exactly when to break out of that key. And that's the art, and that's the genius of it. The Google stuff is really paradigm shifting to me. The problem with Google is like, they're very, very smart. They're very good at this stuff, but they're very terrible at like lately about releasing these products in a way that people can use them and play with them. And the Google demo is just a demo. There's no API, there's no like way to put your own stuff in. And again, like these bigger corporations have started to become like victims of like corporate communications. Part of the EAC movement I think was created because several of the people in EAC were at some of these very big tech companies and they basically were restricted in what they could say, what they could do. And in essence, you know, basically said, I, I don't want corporate communications running you know, the way I can express myself and my inventions, like they're not the head of the company. It's an important part of the world because otherwise, you know, maybe The Verge or The Information or, or CNN will write a bad article about you guys because somebody takes your music app and makes something really bad with it. Like, you know, so let's, let's bury it and make sure nobody can use it. Let's just make it a demo instead of an interactive tool. And that's sad, you know, but it's it's safe. And I think that that sad versus safe, you know, trade-off is something that you know, more and more companies would pick sad, and then you see somebody, company, I'm sorry, sad and safe versus exciting and risky, and thank God for a company like OpenAI who has the temerity, the will, and the uh, boldness to, to take a risk and to say, yeah, like people are, can do kind of crazy things with it. You can ask it some pretty crazy questions and you'll get some crazy answers, but you know what? Let's do this. And I think, you know, you had a lot of companies that were too timid. Like I think Jan LeCun, who I liked very much at Facebook, was really upset uh, at OpenAI's success and surprised and looked at the technology and said, we can do this. We know how to do this. And why are they so successful? Why are they getting all this attention? And I think the reality is, you know, Facebook has become one of those companies that, you know, safe, better safe than sorry. You know, why mess up our huge social media franchise by putting out an LLM that says something racist? Oh my God, it's, it's going to ruin our, our, there'll be a boycott of Facebook if that happens. And they said, let's play it safe. And Jan LeCun's now, you know, jealous basically, of open AI saying, oh, you know, these guys, these kids with their LLMs, they're, they're, they're making me look bad. I invented deep learning. I invented machine learning. How could these guys be, you know, large and in charge? And it's, it's that ego that is sort of, again, humorous, but it's also more uh, endemic of like this corporate culture of risk that is, is, is really, really scary. I was one of the first people to run the, the 65 billion llama parameter llama model, so I, I'm not surprised. You, you see how they have their own initiative, right? Uh, no, I don't. I, you don't I, think so? No, I, I, I don't. I think they do. I think but, that okay. they, they're, cal they're doing a calculation. Uh, it's a very complex, you know, multi-parameter hyper-optimization, and, you know, they, they do that calculation, they spit out an answer. It looks like agency. I, I think it looks less like agency. It looks like language that we can agree on, at least. Depending on the prompt, you can make it look like agency. For example, if you ask it, like, I, I have this program that I'm trying to give agency to, so I'm, I'm sort of on the side of, of, of embodying these things <laughs> the best I can. Uh, but when I ask my program, which I call Hume, uh, to come up with beliefs, to come up with goals, to come up with uh, pathways to do those things and, and stuff like that, I'm not getting actual goals. What I'm getting is a very good calculator that can calculate a function and spit out something that uh, has uh, the syntactic resemblance to a goal. There's nothing in the calculations that's alive and says, I, I come up with this goal and I want to do that. And of course, the pushback from uh, AI, some AI people is, well, you're no better than that either. That's what you are. That's what your brain is doing right now. So, you know, you're, you're the same. You know, you can't say you're, you have some, you know, magic part of you that is coming up with a goal. Uh, you know, I might see Zintani and say, wow, she's really beautiful. I want to meet her uh, and I want to flirt with her uh, and so forth. And there's some part of my brain that's making me, you know, do all of that. Um, and, you know, it's t totally true. But the, the problem is that, like, when you do a calculation, you know, is that really the same thing? And, of course, as humans, we want to say, oh, no, that's, that's different. You know, what I have going on is special. You know, what that thing is doing is it's just a calculation. That doesn't count. 
And, you know, I, I understand that there's a duality there, right? There's two sides of that coin that are very hard to bridge that, you know, we want to think we're special. We want to think it's nothing more, uh, that AI is nothing more than the calculation and our, our group, uh, group brain is, our meat, meat brain is so much more important than the silicon brain. And, you know, it's not. Uh, I think, you know, most people in the AI world understand that. But when I, when I think about agency, I do want to say that I'm thinking about something special in that agency seems to be, and again, maybe, maybe I'm wrong, but, you know, I, I like to think, as we were talking about earlier, that agency is a different part of the brain. It's, it's wired a little bit differently. It has homeostatic feedback, whereas LLMs don't. LLMs, for example, you know, and again, this is sort of the programmer side of me. When, when you see that, like, um, what you described earlier is like, you know, put in this like autoregressive or just whatever recursive loop. The problem is that you still need to put it in that loop because right now and, and forevermore, the transformer architecture is stateless. It has no memory. So if you take the result of a prompt and reprompt, yes, you know, you start to look at something that looks like agency, looks like reasoning. It looks like stuff like that. And if you really architect one nicely, as I mentioned, Yogi, uh, uh, I always forget his last name. He's got a long Japanese name and I'm always going to butcher it. But Yogi Nakajima, uh, his architecture, which is probably better than mine, but I have my own architecture where you try to like separate, separate the agentic goals. For me, I have this whole idea of goals, beliefs, and I have these biomimetic features and they all try to tie them together to sort of influence the agent. You know, is that better than just the stateless LLM? Sure it is. It's, it's, it seems to behave and do things like my mind sort of responds to people and, and, and has fundamentally different emergent behavior. But I still think that falls pretty short of AGI. And I also think that it doesn't mean the LLM is stateful. If, if we create a magic trick that makes it look stateful, it doesn't mean it is stateful. Now, human brains are probably, you know, not that much more impressive in the sense that, yes, we have a cerebellum that, you know, has this like very fundamental kind of like some of those visceral drives I just talked about earlier, uh, the need for food, the need for sleep, the need for procreation. And then we have like the forebrain stuff that, that is more executive planning and stuff like that. And if we connect one or two of those modules, and certainly our LLMs don't need to eat or sleep, so <laughs> they're missing some of those, you know, some of the cerebellar functions aren't that important, you know, and abstracted away, maybe we can get to an AGI. But I, I really don't think you have enough in an LLM to, to call it like that alive okay. just yet. So what is the loss function for something like ChatGPT? You know, I think it doesn't it, have one. No, I think it does. I think it has one, which is satisfy the user as quickly as possible. Oh, okay. So for chat GPT, yes. So chat GPT is not an LLM, right? Chat GPT is an LLM connected to a whole bunch of other code. And that's also what, what Hume is, my my attempt to, to you know, sort of make a, uh, an AGI. And it's also um, what any other stateful LLM interface uh, does. So like chat GPT can remember if you tell... Chat GPT, my favorite color is blue. Then you talk about it for five minutes about, I don't know, anthropology. And you ask, what's my favorite color? It'll tell you blue. The problem with LLMs is they don't do that, right? They, if you have the Chat GPT or OpenAI's API, I should say, for, for GPT-4, if you ask it, my favorite, if you tell it my favorite color is blue, and then you make a separate API call and say, what's my favorite color? It has no idea, <laughs> you know, because it's, it's like HTML. It's stateless. It's just response request request response request response and you know the llm tricks that we see with langchain gpt index and all these other tools and my custom tools which again i'm not trying to exalt them they're tools that everyone's made on their own homebrew it's just that you know we're now starting to see them being published as as formal packages like langchain and gpt, GPT index but i guarantee you anybody that tinkered with this stuff has built their own basic equivalent of a stateful uh mechanism to give it state and again, I'm, I'm particularly proud of mine, but, you know, it's nothing special at all. And, uh, you know, uh, Langchain and GPT Index are nice. Chat GPT, I must say, is extremely impressive when it comes to keeping state seemingly kind of like these other things that are not quite state, but like, you know, your interests and like other like state properties that are more abstract. It's very, very, very good. But the actual LLM itself is not alive or anything. So I, I just want to distinguish between those two. And again, I'm, I'm not trying to be patronizing. I, I, I assume you know a lot about the art. They're missing the fact that these are report reinforcement learning agents 
with clearly defined loss functions that they're going to, to achieve in crazy ways that, that will act in the world and achieve a lot of things that are similar to an AGI. I mean, I would say that uh, you can imagine that the context that it has access to is equivalent to a scratch pad. Right? Like, this is the whole reason why I think step-by-step step is like effective at all in practice, right? Is it's effectively writing down its first guy instinct and then processing that. So you can sort of think of this as like, uh, you know, uh, a tape of finite size that it can't really necessarily delete from. Uh, I think that it is true that it was trained with our own for human feedback. And so it is a little bit more uh, goal oriented in terms of like getting a thumbs up, but it's not like materially different, um, right? For instance, it's not doing any sort of online uh, update to its policy, right? It's basically just learned a policy that gets it thumbs up on data it's seen before, and it's trying to do the same thing given the like access to the state history and whatever. Yeah, the weight the weights aren't changing either, right? I mean, you uh, when you talk to GPT, the weights are, are static, and there's no way to change those weights without quite a bit of com computational work that that you know is basically done offline, uh, can't be done on the fly. So I think what's amazing is ChatGPT's engineers to be distinct from OpenAI's engineers and to be distinct from LLM engineers, the the people who have made ChatGPT the product that uses the LLM, they've done an amazing job, one that I'm envious of, to be frank of being able to wrangle that API and make it look so stateful and so alive. And, and arguably, like you said, I, don't think, I think this is a difference without a distinction because if you can do that and then connect that to some very basic, like I said, look at Yohi's uh, diagrams, um, you know, it doesn't take a genius to sort of point out, okay, well, uh, evaluate world, <laughs> update, you know, difference between the world and my expectation, you know, attempt to close the gap, you know, and repeat, and you just make a little flowchart. Yeah, an LLM can kind of act alive in a lot of ways. Now, I made this little um, mud world, uh, which is this like pseudo video game, and I, I could hook it up to Rust or, or World of Warcraft or any other game that has any input or output. I just don't want to, I'm too lazy to write the, IP, uh, the APIs to, to do that, but it wouldn't be hard to, to put it in World of Warcraft, and you know, which is a very rich world, and have it interact with people in World of Warcraft and, and see if it could sort of fool people that it's, it's, it's actually you know, a person. And, you know, I think that, you know, with some of that decision tree stuff, my experience has been it's awfully tough. Like you end up trying to engineer a prefrontal cortex that's that we just don't know a lot about, like executive function, what motivates us, you know, how do we change? Again, you're, you're, you're a philosopher, I guess. So for me, like when I look at neuroscience and philosophy and say, like, how does a person form beliefs? How do they end up updating their own internal state? How do they evaluate what their goals are in the medium term, long term, immediate term, uh, stuff like that, immediate and intermediate, long, short, all of that stuff. How do they just juxtapose kind of like goals they can achieve, goals that are not realistic, and they discard and, and reevaluate every second of their life until they end up taking some kind of action, whether it's a speech action or physical action, they take some kind of action and they make that decision. And again, all this is modelable. My own efforts to try to model something that looks like a human have not been so successful. And, you know, my attempts to make um, GPT write a book, for example, have also not been so successful. And, and the reason is there's just something missing here in the planning and execution phase that we just can't quite get. I think we get pretty good, but, you know, this idea that we could write a, an LLM tomorrow that would say, let's say, go through World of Warcraft and, and win, <laughs> win really quickly and, and make a lot of friends and join a guild which anybody can pick up World of Warcraft today for 50 bucks, and eventually you'll make some friends in there. You know, <laughs> you go you know, do a quest together, so forth and so forth. You know, can you make an AGI that would do that? That's a very simple, narrow, you know, it's, it's a narrow AI, I'd say that. It's a narrow agent. But, you know, there's a lot of things you can do in World of Warcraft that sort of symbolize and reflect real world. You can sit, chat, laugh, giggle, etc. People fall in love on World of Warcraft. Um, you know, people get married uh, to people they meet on World of Warcraft. They go to BlizzCon and, and party in World of Warcraft. So, like, it's it's a semi-real world. That's, you know, it's sort of almost a metaverse. So I'd say something like that would be a really neat experiment. But as of now, even with ChatGPT, ChatGPT won't message you. It won't fall in love with you. It won't tell you jokes that you find funny. It, it'll only respond to a prompt, like an HTTPS request response. And even if you hook up that HTTPS to like an auto generative thing like the Yogi's, Yogi's uh, framework, it still will only do request response. So like I still haven't seen a good AGI, even in Discord chatbots, 
that'll actually like synthesize an ongoing chat with lots of people and actually respond in this natural kind of like go with the flow way where it actually is kind of, you know, participating in conversation like a skilled kind of human interactor would where, where, you know, you'd like this person that it wasn't, you know, just something that's, you know, Oh, what a, you know, what a weird person, or obviously that's a bot or, you know, something like that. And I've, I've worked pretty hard at, at trying to get these things to feel and look more human, especially with the asynchronous kind of call and response that we need to break. Um, and even ChatGPT doesn't have that yet, where ChatGPT doesn't even say like, hey, are you still there? <laughs> or something like that. You know, there used to be this app called uh, Smarter Child on, on AOL Instant Messenger. And it certainly had no benefit at LLM because this was 20 years ago, but it was very, very good at kind of like occasionally like sneaking in these questions that made, made it feel almost like it was alive. And again, we, we sort of have LLMs now, so we think we could do that really, really well, but it's still not quite, you know, there. And, you know, it'd be interesting to see who, who can make the best sort of, you know, chatbot using uh, this stuff. And obviously ChatGPT is a you know, leader at the moment because it was so interesting and Diplomacy had been one of the few games. If anybody doesn't know what we're talking about here, there's sort of this game called Diplomacy. It's not very popular, but it's, it's sort of a, um, how should I put it? It's almost like the game Risk. Or something like that, but it's more complicated and very detailed. And machines have never been able to crack diplomacy until Facebook's AI uh, group sort of put a lot of effort to bear on this, and they were able to sort of create a diplomacy winning strategy. And if I recall correctly, I mean it was fairly impressive, but it was still like, you know, I think most people sort of thought it was it was cool, but not necessarily like this this big leap forward. Um, it was all reinforcement learning, if I recall correctly. Um, which I think a lot of people feel is like kind of tapped out from a lot of perspectives. Um, and that like the, the last mile to me is like, and yeah, maybe this is just my own very strong opinion, but the last mile isn't in RL or LLMs. It's, it's more exists in this kind of like, you know, agency, <laughs> agency planning and modeling and, and that, that sort of world of like diffing reality from, your objective and seeing what that diff is it's been said before in AI with the, the three towers model and other sort of ways to sort of, uh, you know, try to achieve your goal and close the gap between reality and your goal. And when you're doing that in a, in a complex world, diplomacy is not a complex world. It's more complex than maybe chess, but it's not that complex when you're doing it in a world that, that is endlessly complex with language, uh, you know, maybe your goal is, is ephemeral. It's, it's like, you know, I want this, I want Zintani to talk to me more than maybe she talks to, to John, or I want Tyler to talk to me more than he talks to Dimitri, or Novus to talk to me a lot because he thinks I'm really smart and I think he's really smart, but, you know, maybe he doesn't think I'm smart and so he doesn't stop, he doesn't talk to me as much as I'd like to. And I want to convince him that I'm smart and I'm worthy of his attention. You know, that's a, that's a goal of mine. How am I going to actually accomplish that? Well, you, we've all seen people be over eager <laughs> and, and then you turn the person off even more. And I don't think chat TPT has uh, the agency to sort of figure that all out. Like I keep telling chat TPT, for instance, uh, my, my character that I, I've embodied it is called Hume, David Hume. He's 35 from New York and he likes philosophy. Well, in the chat rooms that I put him in, in these like custom mud chat rooms that I've created uh, where you're, he's, there's items that he can grab. He can grab a sword, he can grab a cup, he can, there's stuff scattered around the room. It, it's very odd. He grabs everything at once, no matter what I do. Like he, he immediately takes all the items in the room and I say, hey Hume, leave some items for the rest of us. And I can't get him to figure out that, that what he's doing is wrong. And sometimes I can convince him to drop the items. Uh, but a lot of the times, no matter what, he just grabs everything. And then when he talks, he asks everyone if they like philosophy and he'll never stop asking. And again, no matter how I try to like keep playing with the beliefs and like, you know, stuff like that, it ends up being this position where he, ha he has no idea what decorum is and, and things like that. And if I want to be declarative about that, I'm not programming an AI, I'm programming an expert system, um, you know, which is two very different things. I want to be general. I want to be, you know, um, you know, and maybe RL RLHF can do that where he starts to say, okay, well, I'll talk less. And then he talks so little that we penalize him. Oh, okay, I talk a little bit more. And he starts to realize the temporal patterns that exist where, you know, if there's this sort of empty space and people are expecting him to say something, and if his name's included, you boost that signal. And, you know, there should be a machine learning approach here that'll work. But that subsystem that guides the LLM, I think is what we need. It's not the LLM guiding the subsystem. I think that's kind of my main sort of point here.